we went public in 1992. We've been at it for seven years. It's the first internet company to go public, and we raised a whopping $10 million in our IPO, and the value of the company that day was $70 million. <laughs> the other number I remember is after seven years, we had less than 200,000 customers. And seven years later, we had like 25 million customers. Hello, fellow data nerds. My guest today is Steve Case. Steve was the CEO of AOL from 1991 to 2003. He's also the chairman and CEO of Revolution, which has invested over $1 billion in startups and is the author of several books, including Rise of the Rest and The Third Wave. Steve, welcome to World of Das. It's great to be with you, Aaron. I'm real excited. Now, you've been heavily involved with the internet really since before it was even a thing. Like it was back in the day, it was like illegal for consumers to access the internet when AOL was first formed. And in the early 90s, even only, I think, like 3% or so of the country was online. As someone who's thought deeply about this for over 40 years, what, what kind of surprised you most about the evolution of the internet? Well, you're right. When we were, got started in 1985, it was just 3% online. I think at the time, those 3% were using the internet on average one hour a week. Oh, wow. well, it was pretty early days, not just in terms of people using it, but the amount of time they used it. Some of it because a lot of the online service at the time, CompuServe and some others, you know, often were $10 an hour. So people were on as little as they could possibly be to get their you know, whatever they wanted you know, done. Uh, and at the time, nobody knew about online services, the internet, nobody really cared about them. Uh, most people when we were starting didn't think it was ever going to you know, amount to much. So it's been an interesting journey over the last uh, four decades. One of the surprises is, frankly, it took so long for people to embrace it. It was really a decade from the time we got started, sort of 85 to 95. It was a slog and we were you know, really trying to fight to stay alive, fight to get people to, to see the value of being connected, fight to get PC manufacturers to build modems in because at the time they thought it was not something most people would be interested in. So you have to you know, buy a peripheral mo device, a modem to, to get connected, get the communications companies to build bigger networks at lower cost. There were a bunch of battles we had to fight in that first decade, but mostly it's because people didn't think that most people would ever see the value of being online. It, it, just, it, it seems crazy now in retrospect, but the, in the 80s and, and most of the 90s, that was the, you know, the case. So it took longer to get going, longer to get traction, longer to get kind of takeoff velocity than I would have uh, expected. Uh, but what's obviously what's happened since has been you know quite uh, phenomenal. And particularly, uh, I hate to say it, but during the pandemic, it was interesting that after all these years trying to get people to take it seriously, suddenly the whole world was operating uh, on the internet and you know, wouldn't have been able to move forward without access to the, the internet and, and so forth. So it's been a great journey. I, I remember, you know, in the in the early 90s, like being in college and like everyone used the internet even back then because it was it was free to access. Right. Um, you didn't have to. It was, it was like it, it, the maybe the main competitor to the college internet was like America Online at the time. America Online, I think, still charged like per hour, right. which for a college kid, it would be extremely expensive, especially for a lot of us. We we're spending, you know, somewhere between five and six hours a day on the Internet. We wouldn't have been able to afford it. So it w at some point, like we moved from like a time based thing to kind of an all you like a monthly fee all you can eat right when, when did that start to well, shift there, for most consumers there's two parts of that when when as you said in the intro when we got started consumers and businesses were not able to access the internet it was right, only point. non commercial yeah. use so if you were at a, on an educational campus or a government institution agency or something you had access to the internet but if you're a consumer at home or a business you didn't have access to the internet so for the first few years we and others had to almost create our own parallel universe of, you know which is why it was called online services back then and it was uh, 8990 i think when congress passed the legislation to commercialize the, the internet and it was a few more years before we were able to move from hourly pricing to essentially you know, flat rate monthly pricing uh, because the, the, the new network architectures had shifted to allow that to be possible. And people made, including us, made very significant investments in expanding the, the infrastructure. And not surprisingly, that also is when things started accelerating. With some combination of being able to get the services to be easier to use, it's more accessible more useful in terms of what people could do, more fun, so there was more reason to do it, but also more affordable. So moving away from the meter ticking to, towards uh, flat rate monthly pricing. And and in, in some ways, like the, the key killer app was, is, was 
was and still really is communication, right? Right. Now, for, for, for us, it was for two reasons. One is we did believe when we got started, again, 1985, that the killer app of the internet was going to be people, connecting people in different ways, both people you already knew, ways to stay connected, friends, family, et cetera, as well as people you didn't know, but maybe would like to know because you had some shared interest in a, in a particular you know, topic. So we believe that you know, content obviously is going to be important. Commerce obviously is going to be important, but community was going to be most important. And we placed a, a big bet on that. And, and you know, the whole time I was involved with AOL, from the time we started until the time we merged with Time Warner, I stepped aside as CEO, which was you know, 16, 17 years. Uh, the people-related services, the communications, community-related services were always more than half of our usage. So it really it became kind of a front and center. And so some of that was a belief that the community would be important. Obviously, what we're seeing now with, with you know, Facebook and Snapchat and X and other things is, is, is sort of different versions of ways to connect you know, yeah, people. Uh, so that dynamic still is, is, is true today. The other reason we did it, though, is when we got started with AOL, uh, it was really hard to raise venture capital back then. There were only a few firms, and most people didn't think our little dinky firm outside of Washington, D.C. in Tyson's Corner, Virginia, was ever going to amount to much. So we only raised a million dollars in our first round of financing to launch our first uh, first service. Hello, fellow data nerds. If you're enjoying this episode, please hit that subscribe button. I would super appreciate you being a subscriber to World of DAS. Now, back to the episode. And by comparison, some big companies, IBM and Sears for a little while, CBS, launched a venture that competed with us called Prodigy, and they committed $1 billion to launch Prodigy. Wow. So okay. 1 million versus 1 billion was what we knew was not going to be a fair fight. We knew we didn't have the budget to go acquire rights to, you know, to content or other things. So that was another reason to focus on community. It was essentially, didn't, didn't, it was building the software to enable that connectivity. We didn't have to pay anything for uh, for, for content. To, to, so that, that helped us get going. Then down the road, we did end up partnering a lot of companies, a lot of media companies, a lot of communications companies, and partnerships became a key reason why we grew and were, were, were successful. But those early days, because we were you know, kind of scrappy and didn't have a lot of money, we had to focus on building an easier uh, interface and figure out ways to drive down the, the, the pricing in terms of some of the negotiations with the communications company, but also focus on the community features because we believed that was, as I said, the killer app, but we also knew that that was the most efficient way to get into the market. When do you go from this kind of like broader idea of community to the AOL Instant Messenger, the AIM? Because that, that seems to me like when, when I think of AOL, at least in like the 90s, that was like the, the killer app was literally just being able to instant message people. Well, it's, it's a couple couple uh, answers to that. First, the first service we launched in the fall of 1985 included instant messaging. That was one of the features that we, we launched back then. But our strategy back then, again, so it goes back to you know, not only not having much money, so we needed to figure out ways to be scrappy and, 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 and enter the market is our strategy is to partner with the PC manufacturers, particularly ones focused on the home computer, and work with them to launch service. So our first service was actually something in partnership with the Commodore 64 computer called Q-Link. Then we did something in partnership with Radio Shack at the time. You know, Tandy, uh, the parent company, was a big, big uh, uh, major yep. supplier of computers. We created something with them for, for their computers called PC-Link. And we created something with IBM called Promenade. And then we created something with Apple called Apple Link Personal Edition. So the first four or five years, it was basically these private label services in partnership with each of those companies because they would then market it. We didn't have to spend money on marketing. They'd take the lead on, on marketing. And so in about you know, five years into it, we decided to combine all those services into what uh, then became America Online. And after a while, a while, people started calling it uh, AOL. So instead of having separate uh, kind of uh, services, almost like white label services, we had one integrated service. Uh, and, and all the while, the community features, including uh, the instant messaging, and then when we added buddy lists and things like that, they were, they were uh, front and center. And then a few years later in... Uh, I don't remember the year, but maybe mid mid nineties. That's when we decided to unbundle the instant messaging service and launched AIM, AOL yeah. Instant Messenger, which was free to everybody, whether you're a subscriber of AOL or not. 
And part of that unbundling was also just to like increase the brand awareness as well. And distribution. We we we, yeah, want, we wanted we wanted to create a lot of reasons for people to subscribe to AOL. We position it then as go to the internet and a whole lot more. You had full access to the internet, pretty high speed, some of the things we're doing with with compression. Uh, as well as a whole suite of services, content, uh, community, et cetera, that were exclusive and unique to AOL. Uh, but we also realized, even though uh, at the time about half of all the, the Internet users in America were <coughs> AOL subscribers at our, at our peak, there's another half that were not, and we wanted to reach them as well. So we launched services like AIM to do that. We also acquired and managed a bunch of other you know, brands, MapQuest and others that we that were, were kind of provided more broadly on the Internet. So it evolved from... AOL itself to AOL plus uh, you know a couple of dozen other brands Netscape Spinner a bunch of other things that we ended up acquiring as well as a number of things we incubated and launched. Now in 2016, you wrote a book called The Third Wave, which I think was influenced a lot by the Alvin Toffler book of the same name, and it's kind of outlining your vision for the next phase of the development of the internet. Like wh- where. Where have we, in the last eight years, like, how has that played out based on that? And where do you think we're going from here? Uh, first of all, I, I, the Toffler book, The Third Wave, was really uh, a big deal I, for me. When I was in college in the late 70s, 79, 80, I think it was, I read his book, The Third Wave, which you know, I was really kind of fascinated by. He basically was saying, again, it's hard to believe because this is over four decades ago, but he was saying that we'd, we'd started with the agricultural revolution and then we saw the industrial revolution and then we we're going to have this digital information revolution. And this is obviously the internet and all the things we've seen since then. And so that's what got me interested in being part of the internet, helping take that idea of the internet and make it, make it uh, real. So when I decided to write a book, I borrowed that title because I, I and it started the book with my story of, 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 of reading his book and then getting to know him over, over the years. And he passed away, but thankfully I was able to, read my version of the third wave before he did, did uh, pass away. So that was sort of the backstory on, 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 on the third wave and, and Alvin Toffler. My three waves were focused on the internet. And I really, the first wave I was saying was getting America online, getting the world online, going from that world where 3% of people are connected to getting everybody connected and all the things that had to happen in terms of building the on-ramps, the servers, the modems, you know, all the things to get people you know, connected. That was really the first wave. And it was really more the 80s and 90s. Uh, and I well, was part of that, but obviously dozens of other companies were, were part of that. That then set the you know the the table for the second wave, uh, which since all that infrastructure was now built and everybody was connected, you didn't have to worry about that. So essentially, as you well know, it was building apps and services on top of the internet and Google and Facebook, all these things essentially were running that play. And so we can take in for fact, granted. We, we, in some ways, we got lucky, right? Because in uh, maybe ninety nine, you know, late nineties, we had a bit of a bubble, so we we almost overbuilt. Um, and, and so then we had a lot of opportunities to take advantage of it in the in the in the first decade of the 2000s. Yeah, first of all, it went from nobody being connected to everybody being connected. One yeah. one data point I remember it took us we went public in 1992. We'd been at it for seven years. It was the first internet company to go public, and we raised a whopping 10 million dollars in our IPO. And the value of the company that day was 70 million dollars. <laughs> the other number I remember is after seven years, we had less than 200,000 customers. And seven years later, we had like 25 million customers. So it was wow. a slog in that first phase, and then things started taking off. So the, you know, the adoption of the internet yeah, obviously accelerated. As you said, the investment in infrastructure, broadband, other things accelerated. So once that first wave was complete, the second wave was was launched, and obviously a number of things happened uh, there that were basically software apps riding on top of the internet, and, and the combination of that and mobile and smartphones and app stores and so forth obviously has been been pr- critical. So now we're in the third wave. I wrote about it almost a decade ago, and to me, that's when the internet meets the real world, and you, you start taking on big uh, sectors of the economy, important aspects of our lives, you know, healthcare, food, agriculture, education, financial services, transportation, you name it. Uh, and I felt that that was going to be a, 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 a different dynamic. And, and some of the lessons learned the first way where partnerships were critical, engaging on policy was, was, was critical, uh, patience and perseverance was critical, I thought would be critical again in this third wave. And we're seeing that, that most of the successful companies in this, in this third wave and sectors like healthcare do need partnerships. You can't go it alone. They do need to engage on policy because most of these are regulated 
uh, industries. And you do need to be patient because I, I learned uh, the hard way that revolutions sometimes happen in evolutionary ways. And these are not overnight successes. These often are 10 year in the making overnight successes as we had with AOL. And you see that now with many, many companies in this in this third wave. So since I wrote, started writing about that almost a decade ago, it, we're now kind of in the middle of that. And you're seeing the dynamics kick in where uh, entrepreneurs, venture capitalists and so forth that often would avoid some of these industries because they were hard to break into, complicated, you know, kind of uh, regulated, things like that. That's where a lot of the momentum and action is. You, you talk a lot about how like there's these incumbents and they partner with disruptors. Like what are some good examples of that over the last decade? Well, certainly in, in, in the, particularly the second wave and, and you, you and your audience are all aware, there's a lot of companies that really were trying to be full stack providers that were really disrupting everything kind of soup to nuts. And that's worked in, in a number of different sectors. But if in sectors like healthcare, that's not going to work. Nobody's going to create an end-to-end yep. solution. You've got to figure out ways to connect what you're doing with other people. If you have an innovation in healthcare software, for example, good for you, but that's sort of the table stakes to get in the game. You gotta get nurses and doctors to use it and hospitals to integrate it and health plans to pay for it and regulators to allow it. And that's that's really where the big value is being created. One example of a company we backed uh, probably like seven or eight years ago in Chicago uh, called Tempest uh, that's doing a lot of things We're using AI around healthcare, initially around oncology, but now it's shifted. They've established partnerships with most of the leading uh, National Cancer Institute hospitals, about 70% of the, the data from all those hospitals adjusted you know, by Tempest. They've established partnerships with some of the big pharma companies. Uh, and so they built interesting technology, but it was the partnerships they formed that really were, they were the way they were creating most of the value and navigating the policy you know, world is where they also created a lot of uh, value. But there are many other examples in other sectors as well, where where the incumbents need to partner with the disruptors because they don't have the agility, don't not have some of the innovative ideas. But the disruptors also need to partner with the incumbents in a in a way that we didn't see really in the in the second wave. And is that because like a lot of these these incumbents are in a area of the economy where there may have been a bit more regulatory capture, and it'd be very hard to like get rid of those incumbents or well, there's some of that for sure, but also again, it depends on the on the sector. But you continue with the healthcare as an analogy. You're not going to start a company that, that provides every facet of healthcare. It's a very complicated uh, industry. It's one sixth of our uh, economy, and there's multiple kind of facets to it. And so, trying to some people are trying to do certain aspect of certain slices of that. Uh, but I think some of the big winners, like a like a Tempest, are going to figure out ways to co-opt. You know some of the incumbents and 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 figure out ways to work together. And, and I, part of the reason I'm passionate about this, I know some people don't believe in that. Some people just think disruptors should disrupt and ignore the incumbents and eventually try to unseat the uh, the incumbents. But I know for a fact that we never would have survived at AOL if we didn't have a strategy of partnerships. That we, we had something like 300 partnerships at our peak, and so we look for ways to work with. Uh, with other companies, look for ways to make it in their interest to make us successful, to help them be more more successful. So I bring to this that that bias as well as an understanding, partly because I've now lived in Washington, D.C. for four decades, uh, that you know, policy is important. A lot of entrepreneurs don't want to hear that. And and, and uh, I, I get that. They, they do worry about regulatory capture. They do worry that regulations slow innovation down. Uh, and obviously, there, there there is that aspect to it because regulations usually are in place because some problem happened before, and people said we don't want that problem to happen again. That sometimes does lead to things that are out of date and need to be changed. But I think the big innovation in the next ten or twenty years have, will have more of a mindset around partnership and more of a mindset around engaging on on policy. And the big winners will understand that, and, and rather than run from that, run to it, embrace it. There's been this debate. Um, amongst a lot of folks where some people say, okay, there's been a ton of innovation over the last 40 years. And some people say, yeah, but that innovation really is just in bits. And we haven't really seen that anywhere else outside of the bits because of um, a whole bunch of different factors. Where do you fall down on that debate? No, both are true. We have seen a lot of innovation for, for sure, but it goes back to the way I framed the the way I think about the third way when the internet meets the real world, and you know these, these are big industries, important aspects of our lives, and 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 they take time to really kind of reimagine and, and make the plays. A lot of them require systems integration, like like healthcare, uh, to really get uh, get traction. So I, it's amazing to me, having uh, been doing this for now for 
for decades and starting at that early stage that we talked about when the internet really was more of an idea than a, than a reality. It's amazing to see all the progress we made, but I really do believe next you know, 10, 20, 30 years, uh, you know, we're gonna continue to be surprised by the level of innovation, but it does require a, a, a different mindset, you know, the, in terms of dealing with uh, kind of real world industries and, and, and having to embrace policy, embrace partnerships as part of that. So, you know, we had like the big kind of internet kind of wave, let's say in the 90s. Um, then we had the the kind of like the the next version of that, which say the cloud wave in the early 2000s. Then we had like, let's say the mobile wave um, with the next version of that, let's say in the, the, the 10 years later. And of course, during that time, we also had a lot of hype cycles that didn't pan out. Um, where do you think AI fits on these cycles? No, I'm bullish on AI. It's sort of interesting because uh, the AI and the internet started about the same time. They're both 50, 60 years old. It's not, they're not actually particularly new ideas, uh, but it, it, some of these things just take a while to really get traction. And as, as you know, I'm sure all your, 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 your listeners know, you know, we've been using AI on many of our apps for many years, even if nobody said that's what was part of Netflix or part of Spotify or part of many other, 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 other apps. So it's really when ChatGPT had this overnight success, 100 million users in a month or so, that suddenly people woke up to what was happening uh, with kind of these, these new AI you know, platforms. Uh, and that's created a lot of excitement and created a lot of investment. But I think the, some of it is these broad platforms, uh, which are getting a lot of attention and obviously huge levels of investment. But I think it's going to tie in in this next phase with AI and specific industries where, again, the partnership aspect is going to be uh, important. So I think it is a big deal. I think it's, it's uh, whether it's comparable to the Internet, you know, time will tell. Maybe the Internet was a little bigger than AI. I know a lot of people think AI will be bigger than the Internet, but it's in that realm or in the realm of mobile or some of the other things you, you mentioned. So I think it's, it's a big deal. There were some things that we all tend to get into a little bit of hypishness, as, as you mentioned, and jargonish sometimes around Web3 or Metaverse or other kinds of things. And I think AI is much more important than, than those are more akin to you know, what the internet has been. Or, or where do you think we'll see like the biggest disruption the fastest? Well, <laughs> I don't think some of the biggest dis disruption will happen the fastest. It goes back to my okay. theory of, of it's too hard. taking a while. I, I, I think it, I mentioned it before, but I think the industry that most is in need of reimagination and, and disruption for a whole host of reasons is healthcare. I mean, the way we you know, get, deliver healthcare is it's just not great. The cost is high. The convenience is low. The outcomes aren't aren't necessarily great. And you know, we as as a nation uh, don't really stack up all that well. But you know, the outcomes are better. But the other aspects in terms of cost, convenience, things like that, others others are doing better. So that's an area of massive innovation. It's not any one technology. It's a convergence, obviously, of many technologies. But that's one where I think you'll see just dramatic change in the next 10 or 20 years, but I don't think you'll see dramatic change in the next year or two. These are not yeah. things where you suddenly, somebody steps up and launches something and ta-da, you know, suddenly it's a whole whole new world. It's hard to predict though. I, I remember e even e even more than 10 years ago, a lot of people, a lot of radiologists were very worried that their job was going to be put out. All those people are still employed today. None of them have had to get like completely retrained to do something very, very different Maybe they they um, they have a little bit less monotony in their job or something like that, but they still do what they're doing. So the disruption comes at a sometimes a, a slower pace than we we think it will. Yes, and some of this it, 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 autonomous vehicles are a good example. Ten years ago, the conventional wisdom is it's going to happen overnight, and both new companies would emerge, big car companies would do it, the the, the yep. you know, Uber and others would would do it. You know, it's happening, but it's happening relatively slowly, in part because the technology took longer to develop than, than, than people thought, and in part because regulations, were, in that case, were kind of city by city uh, regulations, and some were more eager and others were more concerned. They need to see even consumer you know, confidence and, and, and trust is, is still needs some, some work. So that, I think that's going to be more common in some of these, these new areas. It's going to require, I think, more, I know people want to hear this, but more patience and perseverance than than maybe we've gotten used to in, in the last, in the, in the internet second wave when you did have a Mark Zuckerberg launch something in his dorm and a year or two later it was a you know, global phenomenon. Uh, there'll occasionally be those, those situations, uh, but because we're now shifting from 
launching apps to launching broader based disruption innovation in really large uh, industries that require partnerships and system level integration. I think in most cases it's going to it's going to take longer and be harder. A little bit more like my experience in those early days of the internet, where I was frustrated that people didn't see the value of you know being connected. Uh, but now in retrospect, I realized people actually, we didn't do a good job of telling the story. It was too hard to use. It wasn't useful enough. It wasn't fun enough. It was way too expensive. And it just took us you know, a decade to, to really break through and, and get to the point where every PC had a built-in modem, where the, the flat rate pricing was possible, where every every you know content provider had a had a website you know thousands of new uh, uh, companies launched in the in the in the in the in, in the process and suddenly it went from something nobody cared about to something you know nobody could people couldn't live without now when i think of steve case in the last 10 years or so i think of the rise of the rest so i think of this your focus on really everywhere in the country except for new york and california let's say um and still today, like most of the venture capital goes to New York, California. Um, most of the, if we if we include Seattle, most of like the internet activity that you know happens, if maybe if you include Boston for biotech right. as well, right, happens in a very very small amount of concentrated things. Like, do you do you see that changing marketably over the next ten years? Yes, I hope so. And, and we worked uh, for over a decade on this. I first got into this 13, 14 years ago when I was asked to co-chair the National Advisory Council on Innovation and Entrepreneurship here in Washington. That led to uh, launching an initiative at the White House with President Obama called Startup America. Got me traveling around the country and then worked on uh, Jobs Council, helped pass some legislation called the Jobs Act 10, 11 years ago. Uh, and then we launched Rise of the Rest with bus tours about 10 years ago, then launched a venture fund maybe six years ago. Uh, we now made over 200 investments, 100 different different uh, cities with the idea that there are great entrepreneurs everywhere that do need capital, do need to be connected to other people in terms of networks, do need stronger, more, more supportive uh, startup uh, communities. And we have seen progress. When we start, started on this effort, people thought it was a little bit crazy, kind of like the early days of the Internet. People thought it was a little bit crazy. Now people are more open to the idea. The pandemic certainly accelerated the dispersion of talent, some dispersion of capital. You're starting to see more you know, companies, breakout companies different cities that become tentpole companies that then spin off other positive things uh, over time. And even from a policy standpoint, there's a now a real focus on this with including the Chips and Science Act that's funding tech hubs that, that it will be helpful uh, as well. And I think it's important as an investor as, as to, to see this as an opportunity, not just do what everybody else is doing, but doing something a little bit different. It's a little harder to identify these promising companies in these rise of the risk cities. But if you do, valuations tend to be a little bit lower. And so there's an opportunity for, for a great returns. But there's another part that, that drives me to do this, which is uh, most of the new jobs come from new companies. And if those new companies are only in a few places, guess what? And they're disrupting jobs in other places. What's going to happen is that people in a few places like Silicon Valley can do really well. And a lot of people, a lot of their places, including the middle of the country, Ohio and you know, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, places like that, are going to feel left out and left behind. And that's sort of started playing out in our politics. There, Some of what's happening in our politics now is exactly this divide over opportunity where a lot of people feel kind of left out of the innovation economy and disrespected. Uh, and so changing that uh, dynamic and, and creating more jobs and retraining people for those jobs in more parts of the country is both an investment strategy, I think an innovation strategy for America to have a more dispersed innovation economy, but also a way to at least in part try to uh, bridge a, a very divided country. So it's important for for uh, for lots of reasons. We have, have made progress, but there's still obviously a lot of work to do. But it's, it's to helpful that people like you decide to leave. California come <laughs> to the Washington D.C. area, and and others like you did decide to do that at an accelerating pace over the over the last uh, decade, particularly over the last few years. And some of the people that decided to move someplace temporarily during the you know the pandemic decided to stay there. Many continue to work remotely for the companies that they were working for, but many once they're in those cities see opportunities in those cities, either existing companies that are growing or new companies that are that are forming, and decide to stay in the city but switch to another. Uh, you know, company that talent dispersion is ultimately the most important. I think capital follows the talent. Uh, and the other last point I'll make is over the last several decades, some of the best universities in our country are in the middle of the country, like you know, Michigan, yep. Ann Arbor, uh, Carnegie Mellon, Pittsburgh, 
uh, Ohio State, you know, Columbus, you, know, you can name many, many others. But overwhelmingly, the graduates then left where they were to go to the coast because that was the land of opportunity. There wasn't a lot of things happening in, in their own backyard. Slowing the brain drain of people leaving and creating a boomerang of people returning will really drive the, the rise of rest. And, and we've been encouraged by some of the, the early evidence of that. Well, one of the things that when when these cities and governments were trying to encourage uh, new jobs in the past, they would, um, you know, maybe give uh, tax breaks something, or they would try to encourage, they would try to throw some money at it and give, or, or change the regulation a bit to get businesses to move there and stuff. But it seems like during the pandemic, people didn't move places because of those reasons, maybe sometimes uh, just like uh, uh, income tax, that, that might have been a reason, but they moved because they, they, they want to be either closer to family or there was better schools for their kids or a better way of life or they like the restaurants. There could be a gazillion reasons. Um, you, you can imagine other ways that these, like a, a Columbus, Ohio could be a, trying to attract talented people rather than just trying to get businesses to start there. Or sure. you think like the businesses is the key. Well, I think the, the interesting dynamic is when we started talking about this 10 years ago, I spent a lot of time with mayors, a lot of time with uh, you know, governors, spoke at a lot of the conferences. Um, and at the time, exactly what you said was the case. Overwhelmingly, the economic development focus was getting a big company to move, either move yeah. headquarters or open a factory or customer service center or data center or something like that. It was about getting big companies to do something. And what started happening about five years ago and then accelerated during the pandemic is, is these mayors and governors were onto the fact that it was better to focus their time and attention on getting new companies to start, some of which would fail, but some of which could be the big companies of tomorrow. And this really became uh, a topic, uh, I guess now four years ago, when Amazon had this national search for the second headquarters and yeah. where 30 cities applied to, to be the second headquarters. And it forced those cities to figure out what they're good at and, and what also some of their, their weaknesses were. And uh, yeah, eventually they decided to, to, to do it in Northern Virginia, not far from where we started AOL, which is remarkable because when we started AOL, there was no startups at all around here and no capital <laughs> around here. So it just shows you the progress the D.C. region broadly has has, uh, has made. But interestingly, a lot of those quote unquote losers said, let's keep fighting and let's use what we did to put together our Amazon bid and try to focus more on the next generation of companies, try to launch something that maybe could be the next Amazon. And so that focus has really uh, kind of gotten a lot more momentum in, in, in recent years. And that's one of the reasons I'm optimistic about what's going to happen in the next you know, 10, 15, 20 years around Rise of the Rest. But these, these even if they do become big and, you know, most of these uh, companies don't employ that many people at headquarters. Um, you know, most of Amazon employees are in in various warehouses all across. They're already all across the U.S., right? Um, but like the number of people in Seattle is relatively small um, compared. Like we're not, you know, about creating like millions of jobs necessarily. So, like, well, yeah, or, yeah, yeah, do no, you think it's or is it like a trickle down? You think that like really helps these uh, local uh, economies? Well, when I first met Jeff Bezos and he was just starting Amazon and pitching to be on AOL and it was a book book service, you know, they had like, I don't know, five or 10 employees and said, well, if they're successful, maybe they'll end up with I don't know, 100, 200 or something. Well, it turned, <laughs> out, it turned out it was a little bit bigger than that. And, yeah. and so you never know with these things. And an example, I mentioned that company Tempest in, in Chicago, they now have over a thousand employees in okay, Chicago. That's yeah. StockX, we backed in Detroit, they have over a thousand employees and in Detroit. So you, there are jobs created by these companies in these different cities. But you're right. And you know, they're over, as the companies really scale, they start distributing their their, their workforce. And, and, and that is going to accelerate in these in these next uh, few years. And we saw a lot of it during the, the pandemic. But launching new companies that have the potential to grow. Even AOL, we started in Tyson's Corner, Virginia. We started with about 30 employees. Our peak we had when we merged with Time Warner, we had 10,000 employees, and the majority of them were in Northern Virginia. And some of those people then went on to start other companies or start other venture funds, and you get that flywheel going. A great example is Indianapolis, this company, Exact Target, got started yep. by uh, sure. Scott Dorsey, and, and they eventually yep. sold to Salesforce. At the time, they had 1,000 employees, and, uh, and, and Salesforce doubled it. The Salesforce now has 2,000 employees in Indianapolis, their second largest office outside of San Francisco. And Scott and a lot of the early Exact Target people have gone on to start several dozen other other companies focused on enterprise software 
in Indianapolis. And you know, 10 years ago, you visit Indianapolis, most people would say nothing's happening. Well, it turns out a lot of things happening. And that's true with dozens of other cities uh, as we've traveled around the country and made these investments. In a world where in a world where remote work is increasing and more people can work um, from home, uh, potentially multiple time zones away from the headquarters um, and just work from home in general. Um, how do you think that changes how these cities should be looking to attract people? Is it should they be looking more for you know something that's more family oriented, you know, or as I mentioned before, better restaurants? I, I don't like. Yeah. How how do how do well, we change a lot, that? With a lot of these cities, it, 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 different than Nashville, Denver, you can name yeah. dozens of them are great cities with great lifestyle Absolutely. benefits and you yeah. know, great entertainment benefits, great restaurant benefits. You know, kind of you know great places to raise families, lower cost of living than you know New York. You know, San Francisco, Boston, yeah. and other things. So they've always had that. They just didn't have this innovation engine job engines, which is why people, you know, weren't there and, and, and people didn't have the ability exactly to your point of, of being a remote worker for some other place. So it's a game changer in terms of how this, this plays out. And some of that is also true. One of the problems we have with the with these rise of rest cities is companies would get to a certain point and then sell out. Often yeah. too early. Exact Target, for example, almost sold to Salesforce several years earlier at less than one tenth the price. They, you know, for, their deal didn't end up happening, and they ended up yeah. public, and then Salesforce, you know, bought them. And so, selling too early is a, is an issue. And part of the reason they don't they sell too early, they don't have access capital for that growth capital that's starting to to change. The other reason they sell early, they don't have access to the talent to grow it from. 200 people to 2,000 people to 20,000 people. Well, now some of that executive talent that has experience with hyper growth can be accessed remotely and maybe come to the, you know, the headquarters you know, once a month or some, some, some every once in a while. So you're able to, no matter where you decide to start your company, aggregate more people who want to be in that city, including getting some people to boomerang back to that city, and also able to tap into talent wherever it might be for specialized skills that, that historically you wouldn't able, weren't able to access, which then did lead to some premature exits. Now, speaking of a non-California, New York area, you and I both live in the D.C. area. Uh, you've been here a long time. You're kind of like the grandfather of tech in the D.C. area. Like, what, what's so special about it? Why do you like it so much? Well, I first I came here by accident. I had no plans to be in D.C. I, I was I ended up moving uh, to the area in, in Northern Virginia in 1983 to join a startup uh, that a few months after I arrived failed. Uh, so that was a whoops and, you know, kind of a welcome to the NFL and, you know, welcome to the world of startups, which some things work, but a lot of things don't work. But thankfully, two of the people I met at that company, uh, Jim Kimsey and Mark Seraf, and I decided to then start America Online a couple of years later in 1985. So the reason we started here was because we happened to be living here, because we yeah. happened to be working for something that just failed. And like, OK, what do we what do we do now? Uh, and it was hard to get going there, which is partly why I have this empathy for entrepreneurs in these rise of the rest cities. It was hard to raise the you know, the venture capital, none of it came from the Washington, D.C. area. It was hire, hard to hire people because nobody from these big established companies wanted to take the risk of, of joining our little scrappy uh, you know, you know, company. It was hard to get people to to, to, to pay attention. Uh, what's changed in the last four decades and what Amazon's decision to do their second headquarters here, I think, is represented. But it has developed as a as a you know, you know, still work to do, but as a much stronger uh, innovation you know, corridor, much stronger uh, around startups, much stronger around certain sectors, around cyber, de defense tech, other kinds of things. And, and as we move further into this era, we talked about earlier with the third wave where policy and partnerships matter more, you know, a lot of those policies, not all, but a lot of those policies are going to be determined in Washington, D.C. and being close to that can give you a competitive advantage. And I saw that in the early days of AOL, when we were trying to commercialize the internet and do a bunch of other things, drive open access of, of the internet, you know, having more of a voice because you have a kind of a home court advantage is, is helpful. So a lot of different industries happening here, including in sectors like hospitality, the biggest hotel company other than Airbnb in the world. Hilton and Marriott are both located here. <laughs> and some of the largest defense companies are are located here. You know, the, one of the most active in, uh, venture capital investors in the country, maybe the number one investor in the country, InQtel, which spun out of 
a government focusing on on, on, on seeding you know companies that had technology that could be useful to government is is, is headquartered here. Uh, so there's a lot of things. And I, the other thing I'd say beyond the technology world or even the business world, what I do think is interesting about uh, the D.C. area, and I'm sure you've seen this, it's an interesting mix of people. It has a a, a global uh, you know, uh, kind of attraction. It's a magnet for young talent that wants to change the world, whether it be in politics or nonprofits or or or, or business. Uh, it has things like the Smithsonian Institution, which I was involved in, including chairing for several uh, years. And so culturally, it's got some uh, great, uh, you know, great advantages. So it's really it's not so much a, a one one trick pony. It's that maybe Silicon Valley is a little too much about technology. Maybe LA is a little bit too much about entertainment. Maybe New York is a little too much about finance. While there is a political aspect to Washington, it's much more dispersed in terms of, of the community, the culture, the the opportunity. I think that's appealing to people as well. One of the, like, I guess I would say both advantage and disadvantage of the culture in DC is it, it seems to be good at working on hard problems that take a lot of time and like good at kind of like the plotting. Um, and it doesn't seem like as good at like getting places in a hurry. Um, I, I don't know if you would agree that's with fair. me or I not. Fair. That's fair. I mean, obviously, the startup sector is is in a hurry, but sometimes the startups in this region are tackling some of those industries, tackling some of those challenges that do require partnerships or you know, changes to policy, things like that. So it, it does require more of the patient. But I think it's a fair you know, observation that things move a little more slowly here than, than we would like. Uh, but ultimately, when the change happens, it can be pretty transformative. And also, it's, I think it's important to know when you talk about policy regulation, people generally are focused on the negative aspects of it in terms of slowing down innovation, regulatory capture, things like that you talked about, which for sure are there. The other aspect is a change in regulation, a change in policy can open up opportunity. When Congress passed legislation to commercialize the internet, that right. created the internet. Uh, when you know, so these things, when when one of the companies we backed, DraftKings, when the Supreme Court made a ruling that allowed states to allow gaming, that opened up a big opportunity uh, to create a much larger company, much more valuable company. So it's not just dealing with the existing you know policies, existing regulations. It's seeing what changes might happen in the future that unlock opportunities. And I think you'll see a lot more entrepreneurial focus, a lot more investor focus on those new opportunities, including the last couple of years. I mentioned Chips and Science Act, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, the Inflation Reduction Act focused on, on, on climate tech has suddenly fueled a much more significant focus on those areas and investment in those areas because of a change in, in policy. You are, I would say, extremely optimistic person. Is that like ingrained at birth or is that from experience? Like how, how does that, because I do think that like that Venn diagram of being like an optimistic person and a smart person is a kind of a rare overlap. Usually smart people are a little bit more pessimistic um, and that where overlap usually means a great founder. Um, so how, how did that happen with you? I don't know. I, I think I, I, some of it just uh, you know lived experience and in, in like with the internet, believing in the idea. When I read that Alvin Toffler book at my college dorm in 1979, saying somehow that's going to happen, and and take, took me five years from that date to actually you know co-found America Online, and took another ten years from that before the internet really took off. AOL really took off. So, but I, I always believed it. I, well, there's times, to be honest, where I, one trail would survive. We had to, you know, mm -hmm. had some tough times. We had to go through some layoffs a couple of times. So I, I, I was worried about our own survival, but I never really doubted that the internet would end up being a, you know, a phenomenon, kind of this new medium, new industry, kind of change the world. So I think I, I've always had that, I guess, that optimistic view. When I launched Rise of the Rest 10 years ago, I actually thought it was a little bit like the early days of the internet, that when we were talking about the internet, people were skeptical. When I started talking about Rise of the Rest, people were skeptical. Eventually, the internet became mainstream and, and people embraced it. Now people are starting to see the, you know, what's happening in different cities and, and embracing it. But I do think to, to have this kind of impact, to have any significant change, you've got to be optimistic. You've got to focus on what's possible. You've got to figure out ways to build alliances and partnerships to get people on board with their companies that might partner with you or working on legislation like the Jobs Act require working with Republicans and Democrats in the House and Senate and getting them focused on on the issue of why it was important to provide better ways for you know, entrepreneurs to access to capital, allow things like crowdfunding, create an easier on-ramp for, for young companies to go public, things like that. It was more about selling the idea of America leading the charge in, in this next wave and maintaining its lead as the most 
innovative entrepreneurial nation in the world, creating jobs, which is where most of the jobs do come from new companies under five years. They're selling them on that vision, which then got them to be supportive of those ideas. So I just found that the optimism is uh, is the better way to go if you're trying to usher in a better reality and you need to do that in, in partnership with lots of other folks. One way we're, and I, I'd love to get your thoughts, that I see you as like maybe different than some of the other super well-known um, um, technology entrepreneurs is a lot of the, a lot of them are kind of like swashbuckling outsiders, break the glass um, kind of folks. You seem to um, operate extremely well, just as well on as on the inside, as well. Um, working within the system, you, know, you mentioned multiple times building partnerships, uh, doing BD deals, etc. Um, and it, it just shows that there are many, many different ways to be successful. Would you agree with that assessment from me, or would you disagree? <laughs> No, I think there's probably some of that. I, I do think, as I said several times, it, it, it's partnerships are important, engaging in policy is important, and taking a long-term view and persevering is important. And, and yep. you know, again, it goes back to my experience. If we had tried to do AOL on our own, like a full-stack solution with our $1 million of venture capital, we would have gone out of business in a minute and a half. And so it, it's survival, let alone success, required you know, kind of partnerships and taking a a long-term view and not being, you know, just recognizing that, that it's going to require some work and, mm-hmm. and, and so forth. So I think that that mentality is important. I, I'm sure some of this is just age. I turned 65 when I started AOL. I was more like 25, 26. So I probably was a little bit more swashbuckling and, <laughs> and you know, think, think everything, think I'm smart and think everything's going to happen overnight. And so some of it is just lessons learned from uh, over the years and, and, uh, Hopefully, it's a little bit of, of, of wisdom. And I, I, at the same time, I have great respect for any entrepreneur trying to do anything. And if people are able to launch things that are overnight successes, obviously, as an investor, love that. Uh, I just recognize that that's going to be more the exception than, than the rule and taking the longer view, establishing the partnerships, working sometimes with those partnerships within the system, sometimes trying to influence policy regulations to, to make sure that the disruptors are advantage, not the incumbents. That's one of the battles I've been fighting recently. I testify at the Senate at the second AI forum that Senator Schumer hosted. And my message was we need to make sure as AI takes hold, it doesn't just lead to big tech getting bigger. We need to make sure we're uh, opening this opportunity up to every everybody and may require making sure the large platforms are open and also making sure open source is a real viable alternative, even though there are risks associated with it. So uh, it's it, to me, it's all about trying to you know kind of play a role in 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 uh, America's innovation economy do what I can to make sure America does continue to to lead I, I, I mentioned I got started with rise to rest when I was asked to co-chair the National Advisory Council on innovation entrepreneurs 14 15 years ago I was asked to co-chair restart it and co-chair it by Senator Ramon, uh, uh, secretary Ramondo uh, who runs the Commerce Department and done that and just last week we actually uh, issued a report from the National Advisory Council, NACI it's called, uh, around how does America continue to lead the way and what steps do we need to take in terms of more investment in R&D, smarter tech transfer, changes in immigration policy, you know, incentives around capital, many other things to make sure you know, America continues to lead the way. You were, um, I I'd say, until you left AOL, you were definitely the most famous graduate of your high school in Hawaii. Then, like a few years after that, you were eclipsed by Barack no, Obama. No, beyond <laughs> eclipse. That, that's actually a, the, uh, Bob, when he moved to Washington, he became a senator. Uh, and we were at an event together. And I, I, I say hi to him and say, oh, it's good to meet you. You're the most famous guy I ever graduated from Puno School. I told him then, and this is before he announced for president, that, well, I have a sense that that's going to change. And sure enough, <laughs> a year later, he was in the White House. Uh, I, I thought, he's, 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 it's amazing to watch his, uh, his, his trajectory. And, and I, 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 before we did this interview, I checked your guys' ages. He's like three years younger than you. So did you overlap with yeah. him in high school? Yeah, I was, a, I was a senior when he was a freshman. So I don't remember having classes with him. I do remember playing basketball with him. I remember he was a better basketball player than I was, even though he was three years younger. Uh, but I didn't really know him. Well, it was a school with about you know, 3,000. It's the largest uh, independent school west of the Mississippi. The, I think about 3,000 oh, 3, people so in the school? 400 in each of the you know, class in high school. So it was 1,600 oh, wow. in the high school. That's a, so, that's a big, so, that's a big I, school. I was okay. aware of him, but didn't really get to know him until he, he moved to Washington as a center. Okay. Oh, amazing. Uh, this is great. All right. Last question we ask all of our guests, what conventional wisdom or advice you think is generally bad advice? Good question. Um, well, I'd say if we think about entrepreneurship, 
the advice often is a great entrepreneur uh, who has, you know, conviction about their ideas uh, can make things happen. And at one level, of course, that's the case. But I think it way too celebrates the entrepreneur and way under celebrates the teams that really are, as you all know, required to take any idea and make it scale. So it's it's more focused on the you know entrepreneurship as a team sport. I think is is important. And the other goes back to some of the things we talked about is this notion of kind of disruption, full stack, ignore the incumbents, just you know crash into the market and and, and try to kind of you know you know kind of get the whole shebang that happens in some instances, but in far more instances, I think there'll be more in the future. It's figuring out some way to to knit together a tapestry of alliances to together do things that you can't really do on your own. Sure. Go, I'd love to ask you a couple of questions on the first one. So on the first one, you're basically saying like the the, the founder is less important than we than we um, uh, um, kind of uh, uh, ascribe to them. Well, I wouldn't say that I would, less important, but because obviously they're important. They're the, the yeah. leader and they, they, they drive it forward and, and, and they're critically important. I just think sometimes it ends up being you know, Steve Case did this or Mark Zuckerberg did that or Bill Gates did that or Elon Musk did that or, or what have you. Um, and the reality is, uh, certainly my experience, I think in all their experiences, uh, it was partly that person, it was partly that idea, it was partly that time, partly competitive dynamic, mm-hmm. maybe a little bit of luck, but mostly the team. And so assembling the right team with the right mix of skills and perspectives uh, is to me, the, you know, the, is as important as the, as the idea or the or the founder, and so it's the ability to take the idea and execute against that idea. And there are many facets to that, but the, the team is sometimes under under celebrated. In history, there's this idea of like the great man theory. Some people in entrepreneurship call it like the great founder theory or something. And of course, there's a lot of people on both sides of the debate. Like, do you think a lot of these innovations would have happened anyway if those people just weren't alive? Or, um, or do you think like actually they are like these people are actually the ones shaping the innovations? Well, I think most of the things that eventually happen would eventually happen, but they might have taken a lot longer, and, and maybe yeah. they wouldn't have been developed in, in as as a compelling kind of way. Uh, you know that you know Steve Jobs, for example, obviously is celebrated for his work with Apple, both the early days and creating you know one of the first you know computers, and of course later on with all the other things he did with the iPad, iPhones, and things things like that. Those ideas, you know, the computer, personal computer, was going to happen. I say, yeah, there was a Xerox part. Eventually, uh, smartphones with apps were going to happen, uh, and so I think most of these things, the internet, in my case, was going to happen with or without me, with or without AOL. Uh, but entrepreneurs can certainly drive it in a certain direction. You know, seize a particular opportunity, create a, bring a certain mindset you know, to it, assemble a certain team that that can you know kind of tackle it. Uh, so I, I, I think that the, the, the role they play is it's critical. I don't want to diminish that i just think sometimes it, it, it the team aspect needs more attention and sometimes the context including the timing uh needs more you know more attention yeah it's always interesting. like you know 24 years ago there there's this famous car ride where elon musk and peter Thiel and elon's driving his mclaren and he flips the mclaren and um and lucky for them like they both come out like some pretty much unscarred, maybe not emotionally, but 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 unscarred. But you could see it like easily going the other way, where like could have both been killed, like like that. And it, it does it, to me. I do think like the world would be very different today if they were, if they, if that, you know, if, if that if that car crash turned out a different way, or you or or you think okay, you know, broadly, obviously it'd be a tra- tragedy, but broadly um, we would have had like similar innovations. Well, I think both could be true. I, I, okay. Of course, of course, you know, Elon or others you know, played a, a central role in, in innovations across a number of different you know, technologies and industries, and you know, don't want to diminish that in any respect. At the same time, and, and he did get, you know, he should get credit for, you know, the sort of the current EV revolution, which was started. 40, 50 years ago, including by GM, and then for a whole host of reasons, kind of was was stopped. Yeah. And, and the space the space whole, whole revolution thing, going thing as well. Going. At yeah. the same time, if, if Elon hadn't existed, obviously Tesla wouldn't exist, and we wouldn't have the momentum now with many other companies, Rivian and others doing interesting things in, in that space right now. But do I think that eventually 
somebody somehow would have okay, taken sure. a, stab, a stab at EVs. Yeah, I think it, I think it, w- it would. So, uh, you know, it's a combination of the right person with the right team, with the right idea at the right timing uh, that, that, you know, uh, is really what, what can be so magical. All right. This has been awesome. Thank you, Steve Case, for joining us on World of DAS. I follow you at Steve Case on Twitter. I definitely encourage our listeners to engage with there. This has been a ton of fun and I'm a huge fan. So I'm really happy that uh, you're on World of DAS. I enjoyed the conversation. It's great to have you in the DC area. And if you're a super data nerd, go to worldofdas.com. That's D-A-A-S, worldofdas.com and sign up for our weekly data as a service news roundup newsletter. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, consider rating this podcast and leaving a review. For more World of DAS, and DAS is D-A-A-S, you can subscribe on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or anywhere you get your podcasts. And also check out YouTube for videos. You can find me at Twitter at at Oren, that's A-U-R-E-N, Oren, and we'd love to hear from you.